Good morning, everybody. We welcome you today. How thankful we are for you. It's a joy to have you with us. To all of you who join us online, welcome. We know you're there. We hear from you, and it's a, it's a joy to have you join with us. This morning, as we start our time together as God's family, we're reading from Psalm 148, verses 11 through 14. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, Young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people, praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him, praise the Lord. And so this morning, as one family in Christ, we are here to praise the Lord. Let's do it together with our hearts and our voices. Amen. Let's praise the Lord together by singing this great hymn, number 68. We praise thee, O God, our Redeemer. Let's stand as we sing. Now we're going to sing that other wonderful song, Great Are You, Lord, and Worthy of Praise, number 159. singing. Now let's turn to one another and greet one another in love.
Good morning, TFB Church family. How are you doing this morning? So glad to give you some announcements for today. Um, connection cards. If you are uh, have some new information to give us, we'd like to stay connected with you in any shape or form that you would like to give us. So they're in your pews, and you can drop those in the offering box um, in the back. Um, summer camps are coming. How many of you are excited to either send your kid away or to go off to camp? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> family, I'm um, sorry. The TFB youth is from the 9th to the 13th. See Jeremy, wherever he is. There he is. Um, for more information about that, and of course, family camp's coming um, the 9th through the 13th of August. So get those tents and the sleeping bags and all those good things out. Check them. Um, backpack ministry. I know. It's sad to talk about school, right? I know. <laughs> Trust me. Um, but go ahead and um, take a look at the backpacks that are uh, needed for um, this, the fall. And I'm sure there's lists and all that good stuff to um, get those um, items ready for our backpack, backpack ministry. Bob Crutchfield, how many of you remember him? He's uh, moving away from um, one home to another. And so if you are interested in sending him a card um, uh, by the 27th on Tuesday, if you can drop those off and we will sure to get those to him. Let him know how much we love him and support his transition. Um, now it's my time to share about Light Seekers Camp. Um, I was away with uh, about 75 of us last week um, for Light Seekers. It's a ministry that's been going on for years, and um, we decided to focus on Jesus being our light, and we are light keepers as light seekers. And so we got to um, have a time of, oh, well, let's see, a lake trip was in there. We had some um, zip lines and all that good stuff. But in the meantime, through all of that fun, we got to focus on the fact that we are light keepers as well. And so we studied from God's word about some uh, light keepers from, uh, from Bible characters um, and that how we are charged um, in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, that we are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. So I'd like to share one of our um, missionary kids that went up, uh, made a video of all the pictures taken. It's about a 10 minute video, but we're going to cut it down a little bit. I'll post it on the Facebook page so you can see all the ins and outs of camp that week. But take a minute and um, pray for each one of those kids that you see. Pray that they would continue to seek after God, that they would be like keepers of his word. So go ahead. Let's play the video. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Trust the promise, you will carry me safe to shore. Love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are my light, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you. Whoa, my lighthouse, my. Sure. Oh, 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 oh. Say to 
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Oh, come on my soul Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord You get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those songs. Get up and praise the Lord. Awesome. Saw a lot of familiar faces, saw a lot of faces from the other churches, but yeah, let's definitely keep remembering to pray for those kids. And Carla, thank you for your leadership with that um, for many years now, so praise God. Uh, light seekers, how many of you went to camp? Awesome, awesome, sweet. Camps are awesome. I love them. Uh, it's where I kind of felt the call to ministry. 
so many others have over the years and dedicated their lives or rededicated their lives to Christ. So praise the Lord for that. Let's keep supporting those ministries. God, put this on. Let's get on our feet, huh? We're going to worship the Lord some more today. Uh, do you guys believe in the promises of Jesus? Yes. Do you believe that his promises are yes and amen? Amen. Then let's sing it out, all right? Church, we got a new song to teach you today. Jeremy's going to be bringing the word on beholding this wonderful, wondrous mystery that the Lord has revealed to us in, in the gospel. And this song simply says, come behold that wondrous mystery, um, a mystery that's revealed and, and, and now we know, praise God, and we can live in light of that. So sing this new song.
try that one again, okay? You guys ready? One. that foretaste of deliverance, that even now we can live that resurrected life, oh God, because of what your son did for us. Lord, we have nothing without you. All these promises that you have revealed to us are only made possible by the blood of Jesus Christ. And in power, you, Lord, were resurrected, and one day we will be too when you come. So we look forward to that day when you shall come again, riding on the clouds in glory and majesty and splendor. But right now, Lord, help us to live in light of who you are.
Give us your eyes for those around us. Lord. Give us your eyes for what you would have us to be in this world. And may we surrender to you fully, wholly, completely. It's not about us. It's about you. We give this time to you. Bless Jeremy as he brings your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, sit down. Amen. Amen. Dan, thank you so much for leading. Oh, good morning, Torrance First Baptist. So, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jeremy. I'm the youth pastor here. Speaking of being the youth pastor, I have one announcement youth-related, and that is at the end of every um, month, uh, the, Sunday, the last Sunday, uh, we as TFB youth all together are going to go to the beach and do youth group there. So we're going to be at Redondo for the youth parents. Um, we're going to be at the same place where we had the activity. And uh, yeah, four to seven is what's going to be like a public ex- display of worship. I'm super excited. And that's today. Youth kids, are you excited to do youth group at the beach? <laughs> Adults, would you, wouldn't you be excited if we did church at the beach? <laughs> Man, y'all want to do church at the beach? Right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So, oh, man, I'm kind of overwhelmed right now. I mean, the worship was just, thank you so much, Pastor Jared. We're continuing in our series of One Lord, One Church, and we're in Ephesians chapter number three. So if everyone can start turning in your Bibles, we're in Ephesians chapter three. Now, while you're turning there, I want to talk to you about a secret Ooh, a secret that I had to keep for three months. And the secret was this. I was going to propose to the woman that I was dating for four years. So these three months were filled with a lot of prep work, a lot of planning. I had to um, talk to uh, my family to get their approval. I had to get a ring. I had to get the approval of my uh, future wife's parents. And she had five siblings, so I had to ask for every one of their blessings as well, just to make sure I had my bases covered. And I also had to plan the perfect way to propose. Now, let's just be honest. You guys know this. I'm, I'm dramatic. <laughs> like, gasp, right? I'm dramatic. And so let me give you a rough draft of ideas that I had to propose to her. Number one, what if I parachuted out of a plane? <laughs> And then as I, you know, and then I land on one knee. (laughs) That was one option. The other option was to make a cinematic movie trailer that she would watch at the movies, not knowing that it was a proposal video for me. And then at the end, she would, um, after I asked her, she would um, see her whole family turn around and she's like, oh my, everyone's here. Uh, Matthew, you're a film major, so if you want to take that advice, you know, maybe you can use that idea. I also thought about organizing a flash mob. (laughs) But as dramatic as I am, Grace is just not. (laughs) She's a straightforward person. And so I had to throw all of those concepts out the window. Now, there was one idea that I had. I remembered that there was a, really early on in our relationship, we were uh, on my campus, we went to two different schools, she visited me, and we had this, this beautiful kind of uh, courtyard, um, like a, what do you call that? A student union square. And on the top floor, there was this outdoor kind of hallway, corridor thing that overlooks the entire campus. It's such a romantic scene. You have the, you know, the basic lights that are hanging around like that, and a wonderful view of the sunset. So I take Grace up to that third floor. I had my earphones on. I put one earphone into her ear. I played Close to You by the Carpenters. And (laughs) I asked her to dance with me. She said it was the most romantic thing that anyone has ever done for her. So what I did was, for my proposal, I reenacted that entire thing. I took her to the exact spot, and at the end of the dance, I got down on one knee, and I proposed. My knee hitting the ground 
That was the mystery revealed. The mystery revealed was that I was going to marry her, that I loved her. See, today we're talking about a mystery being revealed. We'll see what made this mystery so revolutionary. We'll see the significance of who it was revealed to and what this revelation means for us as 21st century Christians. So are you guys ready to know what the mystery is? Are you ready? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you, Lord, God, for your calling that you put on our lives, Lord, to, to follow you with our hearts, with our minds, with our actions. God, I pray, Lord, that you may reveal to us, God, what is it that you would have us to do as a church. Lord, help us to inch closer and closer to being the church that you've called us and destined us to be. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, amen. So hopefully you're in Ephesians 3 right now. We're going to read the first few verses together says this, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has been now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Stop there. Now imagine you are in first century Ephesus, and you are in this church, and you're reading this letter, and you hear Paul mention numerous times the word mystery, or in the Greek, musterion, and it would ring in your ears because of its relevancy. For some of the people, they might even tense up, maybe even be triggered by the thought of this word, musterion. You see, musterion in Ephesus was a common religious concept in which certain specific knowledge was given to certain specific individuals. Now imagine, I am the person who received this musterion. It would look something like this. Hear me, hear me because the people of Ephesus were Old English for some reason. Hear me, hear me. I have received the mystery. Now, if you were just a logical person, you would just be like, well, what is the mystery? And to that, I would say, oh, well, no, that is, that's private information. That's only for me. But I have received the mystery, so you all should follow me, and then maybe one day you might, just might, receive a mystery of your own. Sounds like a cult, huh? (laughs) Thanks, Wolf. So here's Paul talking about this musterion that was made known to him by revelation. And when you read this, you can perceive his insight into the musterion of Christ. A mystery? that wasn't even dropped until right now, not even to the Old Testament prophets. Paul, what would this mystery be? We read in verse 6. It says this. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul received a mystery. That's, you know, big deal. It, It was common in Ephesus. Everyone was receiving mysteries left and right. But here, Paul uses the term in a different manner. While, yes, the knowledge was revealed to a certain few, you have Paul who says that this mystery, this secret, is actually a secret no longer. This secret is for everyone. So Paul is like, you know, hide it under a bushel. No, (laughs) Paul's going to let it shine. The mystery is that Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the same promise. Now, while this would have been amazing news for the Gentiles, 
You know who would have taken this news the hardest? The people whom the Gentiles are now fellow heirs with. You see, for the Jewish Christians, this would have been a very foreign concept to them. Let me try to explain this in modern terms. How many of you guys have been raised in the church? Raise your hand. Many hands. So for many of you, you have heard this idea that Jesus loves you, this you know, for the Bible tells you so. (laughs) My youth kids, I say this to them on a weekly basis, that you are loved. You, li- you have lives of value, of worth, that you were created on purpose for his purpose. Now, the thing is, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because all of that is true. But here's an unintended uh, side effect. When you grow up hearing that constantly, that I am chosen, that I am special, that I am valued, then you run the risk of believing that you are the only ones who are chosen, who are special, who are valued. And that the people that you're listening to um, this message with, the people inside these walls, they're the good guys, while everyone else, maybe not so much. And so for the Jewish church, they had, or the Jewish people, they had this same mentality. They would have clung to verses like this, Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Man, that feels good, right? Man, I'm I'm part of this special people. I'm special, I'm favored, I'm chosen. And so these people came out of the womb knowing this information and hearing this declaration. But the more they heard it, the more fixated they got on passages of Scripture that best benefited them, they seem to deform the passage's meaning that they are the only ones whom God loves and whom God feels, who God favors. This mentality leads to an extra, uh, these extra-biblical mantras that were created, which Pastor Jared read a few last week, right? One of which is, God has created Gentiles to kindle the fires of hell. Another one is, don't help a Gentile deliver a baby. Why? Because that would bring another heathen into the world. You see, their overemphasis on certain parts of Scripture led to an underdeveloped theology. I want to read for you some other passages of Scripture. And when we read this together, you might notice it's like they almost just stopped reading as, like, at a certain part that they just wanted to. Look, Genesis 12, 2-3 says this. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Sounds good, right? I will bless you. You are, I will bless you and make your name great. But it continues. I will, bless, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Why? So that you will be a blessing. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6 says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. Sounds good, right? Wow, we're part of this, the crown jewel of God's creation. But it doesn't end there. It says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And what is a priest if not simply a minister of God? In the chapter, um, in Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 5, it says, Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be plowmen and vine dressers. Oh, man, people from the outside communities are going to come in and serve us to do the jobs that we don't want to do. Sweet. But we keep going. Verse 6, But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They, meaning the strangers and the foreigners, shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. So it seems as if they focused on the passage they liked and kind of stopped reading when it stopped benefiting them. And the result, they separated themselves to the point of isolation. In other words, they hid and cowered under the walls of their community. Another chapter in Isaiah 49, it says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. 
I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. And so Israel was not meant to be a village to hide salvation from the world, but a vehicle to bring God's message of salvation to it. So with all of this background information, let me read this mystery to you one more time. Verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Put another way, this is God's plan, that both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body. Both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. So, what is the mystery? The mystery is revealed, right? It is equality. This brings me to a point about the mystery. That the gospel is a part of this mystery, but it's not the totality of it. Unity, the thing that we are hinging our entire theme on, that's a part of it, but it's not the fullness of the mystery. The mystery is revealed when this last section is brought to it, and that is that both Jews and Gentiles share equal access to Christ and his riches. So why did the Jewish Christians have the toughest time to swallow this pill? The reason for it is that the people who are most against equality are the people who feel they have the most to lose from it. So this brings up a fascinating part of this passage and it's look who this mystery was revealed to it was the apostle paul we know paul right <laughs> the guy who wrote almost half of the new testament the person who was ranked number six in most influential people of all time i i checked online <laughs> he was a pharisee he was someone who knew the law and the prophets, both inside and out, a religious leader and a zealot. And so imagine this, Paul not only being a part of the chosen because of his race, but he was also a part of the elites of the chosen because of his occupation. So interestingly enough, the person who was receiving this mystery, Paul, he had the most to lose from it, and yet he was the most willing to promote it. That doesn't make any sense. And plus, just to add, no, this isn't just lip service on the behalf of Paul. He's not just saying, oh, yeah, we're all equal now, but he doesn't show it with his life. Look where he's currently at. Look what's currently going on in his life. Verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, a, what is he up to? He's a, he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. When you go about down to the end of this passage in verse 13, he says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So you see, Paul, he's like, I'm not just speaking about it. I'm about this life. I am about unity and about the gospel and about the equality of Jew and Gentile. Now, there's one other aspect of Paul's life that I want to bring up. Read again with me in verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. Skip down to verse 7. It says of this gospel, I, have, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. See, the 21st century, we highly revere Paul. Revere Paul. Paul revere... Oh, sorry. <laughs> but we tend to do a little bit of revisionist history with Paul, right? You see, back before the conversion, Paul, when he was Saul, he was like the Mandalorian. He was a bounty hunter of Christians. The first act of martyrdom that took place for the cause of Jesus Christ, the stoning of Stephen, it was done on his watch, 
right? People were laying down their coats at his feet. He allowed that to happen. And so in addition to being a Pharisee, here is what Paul was. He was an enemy of Jesus, a detractor of his cause, and a bounty hunter and a murderer of his followers. And yet this is the guy God chose to reveal the mystery to. This is the guy God, uh, Christ allowed for, uh, to lead the expansion of his church. So when I think of Paul, and he says words like, the very least of all the saints. In 1 Timothy, he considers himself the chief amongst sinners. It's all my King James Version people out there. This was not a humble brag, but this was a man who was bombarded by grace. Right? My grace is sufficient for you. So no wonder Paul can't stop talking about grace because think about how much grace was given to him. So who better to be the main advocate for this, for this mystery of equality than the one who has experienced being both the chief religious leader and the chief amongst sinners, the greatest of the Jews and also the very least of the saints. This mystery was revealed to Paul and because of God's grace, he became the living, breathing embodiment of that revelation. Let me go back to my illustration at the beginning. It's been almost three years, September 19th of 2020, that I got down on one knee and I said, Grace, will you marry me? That my life <laughs> was about to change. The mystery was revealed here. And now, almost three years later, my life is a living testimony of that mystery being revealed. Let me give you an example. If you were to ask me, do you love grace? I would say, well, obviously, yes. And you would say, well, prove it. Then I would say, how much time you got? <laughs> I mean, I can just go on and on about my wife. I, have so many, I had so many examples that I wanted to say, but I don't want to embarrass her because, remember, I'm dramatic and she's not, and she wouldn't want to be embarrassed like that. I will share with you one example, though, a small thing that I did as a way to show her a token of my love. If you look in our backyard, you'll see that there are a string of basic lights. And the reason why I have them there is so that whenever she looks outside at night or um, she comes back home after a long day of work, she comes home, she sees those basic lights, and I want her to remember the day that I proposed to her. I'm telling you this not to try to make my case as the best husband of all time. <laughs> I want to let you know that my life is in a revelation of my love and my marriage to her. And so church, let me ask you, is our life a revelation of the mystery of Christ? Do people, do people see our lives as Torrance First Baptist, as the church, and first of all, do they know that there's good news, or do all we talk about is bad news? Do they know that there is good news, that there is a gospel, and because of that gospel, there is equality and unity amongst God's people, regardless of their age, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, or political ideology? Do they know that? You see, Paul was imprisoned for the sake of this mystery. Church, what are we doing about it? People on the outside hear us sing our little songs about love and unity. But what they see on the inside is division and disunity and even hate. We claim that the mystery is revealed through our church, and yet, when we come in on every Sunday morning, we only hang out with the same five people. I promise you, that was not an illustration I came up with. But I wonder if that applies to our church. You've heard me use this example that we can be so fixated on our clock and on our time that what we communicate with people is that, oh no, you're, you're not worth my time. 
Here's another thing just for fun. We make sure that the preacher is accountable for um, how long he preaches <laughs> rather than allowing the preacher to keep you accountable with his sermon. How does that show equality? How do we as a church show equality when the big C church and maybe even us as TFB, that's, that's the fruit of our actions. That it's just, remember I use this example like, man, I just can't wait to get done with my reserve. Uh, I can't get to wait out of here so I can do my reservation for wherever we're going to eat. Church unity <laughs> takes place. Equality takes place when we're allowed to see other people of the body first of all, and show them love the way that God does. Let me build this even further. The people of Israel were known more for being separated from everyone else rather than the salvation message that they were supposed to be bringing to the world. So I can't help but if wonder if the big C church and maybe even TFB is known more for the walls that hide us from the world than the message that we're supposed to be bringing to it. Church, I can go on and on about examples about what the church is not doing. But that's not the point of this message. The message is that there is a gospel. A gospel of Jesus Christ. That John 3, 16, right? As basic as it is. It's that for God so loved the world, right? They gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's keep the main thing the main thing, folks. Let's focus on what's most important. Maybe not anything secondary or tertiary. Instead of saving money, let's focus on saving souls. Amen. Instead of wanting power, let's care more about people. And so church, what are we supposed to be doing based on this message? It's simple. We're supposed to allow the mystery, we're supposed to allow the mystery to be revealed through our lives. So what does that look like? It's by having these three things in order. So first I'm going to give you an intellectual kind of application, and then from there I'll give you some real, um, I'll give you some applied, lived out to application orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Let's start with, let's make sure that the gospel is the center of what we do here. That's the first thing. For Paul, it was the very foundation. And when you look at the way that he wrote his letter, he kind of allows things to build. And so the first thing is that, man, there's this gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you remember when you got saved? Maybe you did the whole ABC thing, admit that you're a believer, believe, that Jesus Christ died on, your, uh, died on the cross for your sins, confess with your mouth that he is Lord. Maybe we need to go back to that day. And maybe we as a church need to kind of re-gospelize ourselves on a daily basis, not for the sake of salvation, but for the sake of living out the gospel correctly. Let's remember the grace that God has given us. We need to re-gospelize So Paul builds on that gospel to unity. I gave this example to, um, to my youth kids earlier this morning. Imagine you have a rope, and someone's pulling this rope, and the rope splits off into like 18 different branches. If I started pulling it, notice that the parts of the branches start to come together, right? Because they're following the leader of one, they naturally come together. And so for us, if we are one, if we have one Lord, our actions should be displaying that we should be one church. Amen? So gospel, that's the foundation. From there, we are supposed to be united as a people. And then, just then, with this equality thing. Man, there are so many things that provide, that are, we, we create as barriers between us. Oh, you're old. Oh, you're young. Oh, you look this way. Oh, you smell this way. Church, we... I don't think equality is just 
a hope that Paul is like, Paul's just like, man, I hope you guys can do this. No, like he's, he's like, this, this should be a command. This is an imperative. That because if we're about this gospel life, and from there we are united as one church because of our one Lord, that we can see the people around us equally. And you could say that with your mouth, but it is a different thing to live it out. So let me give you some practical examples, and this is how we end. What does it look like for all of these things to be set in their proper places and for equality ultimately to be shown through our lives as a church? I think we need a change of perspective. I talked about saying hi to the same five people. Notice we're almost all sitting in the same places. And so when the announcements is like, oh, hey, everyone, greet one another. What do we do? We greet the same people, too. So how about next week everyone switch places? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. I'm reminded of something that one of my mentors, Kirk Mackey, told me, and is that as a pastor, you honestly need to disappoint people and make people uncomfortable at a rate that they can comprehend. <laughs> because if we stay comfortable, guys, look what's going to happen. We're going to maintain the same results. And isn't that crazy if we expect something different, if we're constantly doing the same thing? But I'm not asking you just, oh, let's just all switch so we can you know, play a game of you know, musical chairs. The whole point of that is so that you can see a different perspective of TFB. That you see other people besides the people that you're constantly seeing on a weekly basis. That instead of maybe five people that you see and only talk to, it could be six. <laughs> when we see the church in a different light and everyone is doing that, look how that increases equality because we see different parts of the body and we think, oh yeah, I forgot you existed but we're still one and we're still equal. Here's another thing. Maybe we can just kind of take an introspective look and see what are the things that we get defensive over? What are those words that might be considered kind of trigger words to us? Some of the words that I mentioned earlier, like unity, diversity, let me add forward, inclusivity. What do you think of when you hear those words? So maybe, well, maybe we might get tense because it's associated with something that maybe we don't believe with. But instead of words to be triggered by, maybe those should be attributes that we live by. And I'm not asking us for, to have this kind of universalist gospel here that everyone is saved. It's, you know, you're saved through a belief in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm not asking for universal accept, uh, universal kind of uh, acceptance. I'm, I'm asking for a universal love. That even if you disagree with someone, even if they make a statement that you don't believe with, even if they look a certain way that you might get irked for whatever reason, you see them as people who God created. For God so loved the world, right? For God so loved the world, even the people that we hate. We need to be known more for the gospel, not for, not for these walls. Next, another thing we can do is, how about we know our community a little bit? It's so easy to think that, oh man, this is the church right here. But it, look what happens. We just get comfortable. And so I'm asking that we as a church community know our surrounding community because that is our mission field. I think one litmus test we can use is, does our church look like a reflection of the people we are trying to reach? Or do we want to just be comfortable, be around people who think like us, sound like us, vote like us. Church, know the people around you. 
I was searching this up. Um, Grace's job, Harbor UCLA, is only 1.7 miles from here. And so that area, if you drive and make a right, they're our community too. So regardless of if we think a place is safe or not, yeah, no, they're still our neighbors. Church, this gospel should affect every part of our lives. We shouldn't just be okay with the intellectualization of the word of God, but may it be realized in our hearts and actualized through our actions. Because if people don't see that we love them, do we love them? Can you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Band, if you come up. Lord God, this, this mystery that you revealed to Paul is a, uh, I can't help but it's, feel like it's so futuristic, even though it was given to us anciently a long time ago. It's almost like, man, how is that so, how is that so revolutionary, even to us 2,000 years later? God, I pray that the people around us in our lives may know us more for who we love and how we love than for what we hate. That our mission statement is to love God, love people, and to teach others to do the same. I'm not saying there aren't things that you called us to hate, but God, may people know us more by our love. May TFB be the beacon of light, of hope, of the gospel, of unity, of equality in this dark world. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Will you stand with us, please, as we cry out, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Reveal to us your mystery and make us, make us know it even more and more every day so that we can see those things that break his heart as Paul did. Amen.
but just be who the people outside know we're supposed to be already. Let's not just sing about breaking, our hearts breaking for what breaks God. Let's, let's actually pray that that happens. And may our lives be a reflection of it. Oh, yeah, I just feel like I just need to pray one more time. Can we just pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, Lord, you, you love this church. You died for this church, God. And now we get to live eternally, God. But may that life not just stay with us. May we, may we extend the idea of your love, of your riches to the people around us, God. Or may we, may we just focus our eyes on what's most important, recalibrate us to what actually matters. And not to get rid of our convictions against sin, Lord, but to love sinners despite them. Help us to love people the way you've called us to. And if we're having a trouble, if we're having trouble doing that, God, help us to just see people the way that you see us. That you loved us, that you died for us, that we have purpose and value of our lives because of you, God. And may we see your creation that way despite how, despite what they look like on the outside. May we see them for the way that you see them on the inside. We love you, God, in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, you guys, well, we have something special right now as we leave from this place. Uh, we are going to be honoring Miss Carla. So um, for nearly nine years of service with our children's ministry, thank you so much, Miss Carla, for living out this mystery amongst us. Um, and uh, we've got some amazing food planned for this. We've got a uh, kind of a cool slideshow of memories, a, a, a book for you guys to sign. Uh, it's like a kid's book that, that we're going to give to Carla as a, as a gift. And there's a photo booth, so if you want to get some photos and you know share those around. Uh, but we're going to ask that if you're going to stay with us, and please do, we got tons of food. Um, Carla's request, taco in a bag. Yes. Yeah, so that's what we get, taco in a bag, which if you don't know what that is, is take a bag of chips, put some taco stuff in it, and shake it up real like that. I'm just you can put it in a bowl. That's fine too. If, you, if that like sounds weird to you, um, but no, it's good stuff. Jeff's been like cooking up a storm in team, so you're not gonna want to miss that. Um, but if I could ask you to go out kind of that way and then go through where Raj and Joyce are back there and go through that hallway and go in through the wedding room. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights, you'll see that. Grab your food, go sit down. Tons of seats uh, in the in the gym. We're just gonna have a great time of celebrating and remembering and saying thank you. Um, so God bless you. God bless you watching at home. We love you. We hope to see you soon. Come on down and join us for lunch. All right, guys. <laughs> Bye.